Okay, so um, yeah, tonight's a lecture on data interchange. Data interchange is one of a few lectures um, that I was very passionate about introducing when I took over the course um, because it's one of these things that actually will like underpin an absolute ton of what you do in computer science over the coming months and probably years. But um, prior to this, it wasn't really actually in a course. You know, it just didn't exist anywhere. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, it's a funny topic because we talk about it in really abstract terms. We're actually learning about some really specific things. Um, but the reason we're learning about all of this is because in computers, there are many different systems out there. Sometimes it's programming languages, C and JavaScript. Sometimes it's operating systems like Windows and Mac. Sometimes it's servers, you know? Clouds, like whatever, everything in computing, phones, iOS, Android, different different ports, USB and this and that. Um, we need ways to kind of send data through a common interface, right? And the way we deal a lot with this is through data interchange formats and everything else. And today we're going to be talking about standard interfaces in general. Let's just look at them from a philosophical standpoint. Then we're going to talk about three fairly specific types of technologies that are used to either like represent or transfer data in a standard way. Because um, it's not always about transfer, even though we call it a data interchange lecture. This is all really about standard interfaces, this lecture. Um, so firstly, what is a standard interface? Um, I know you all have access to the lecture slides, but I'm not above asking everyone in the chat who's live what you think a standard interface is. So do your best to guess. Um, I don't mind. Love to see just a few ideas. <laughs> okay, so Fritzy says, well, judging from the emoji slash uh, cords slash wires, okay. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Cyril says, a specification of data and its types. Okay, standard interface is a specification of data and its types, maybe. AT says, a standard from an exchange of information. William says, fundamental functions and data requirements when sending data. That's also quite interesting. Lots of different ways we're thinking about it here. Well, like, when... When we think about standard interfaces, we could come up with a definition, but tell me what comes to your mind when you think about an example of one, right? Derpy's got some things too. This one's interesting. Derpy says, it's an awesome name, by the way. I hope it's your real name. Um, some universal way agreed upon to unite different languages and stuff. Oh, you were so elegant until the stuff. You nearly got there. Um, when I think of standard interfaces, I don't think of a definition. I think of some examples, right? Um, so what do you think about? And these are just some things. And this, this lecture slide is like, uh, part of it's like a couple years old. So there's a million other things I could think about. But what I think about when I think about standard interfaces, and obviously I'm biased being from a, you know, a computing background in some way, is one example is USB cables. I kind of mentioned this one before. Sometimes I think it's crazy. You know, you can plug a USB cable. Like I've got my Android phone here and like Windows computer. You can plug it in and they have a way of talking and more importantly they just have a physical way of connecting i have like the usb port on my computer it charges the fitbit charges my headphones it can charge my phone it can do a whole bunch of other stuff so that's an example of a standard interface bolts are another standard interface you know even though many different companies manufacture bolts or screws um there are still tons and tons of standardized there is tons of standardization when it comes to what these bolts are you know, you talk about an M4 bolt, a, you know, 3 16th size bolt. Um, everything's kind of follows the same pattern. And you'll see this everywhere, right? You see this with car tires. You see this with, I mean, come up, come on, help me with examples. Doorways. You ever notice that every lounge seems to fit in nearly every door frame somehow just? You ever know, like, you know what I mean? Like everything kind of follows this fairly standard idea that people either in small bubbles or big bubbles tend to come together and say let's all just agree upon a set of standard simple rules maybe it maybe they're not complex enough maybe they don't do, deal with every edge case but it will help us all communicate together you know airplanes runways 
The plane can be built in one country, take off in country two, and land in country three, and everything just seems to work most of the time. You know, it's everywhere. It's a really exciting part of engineering generally. Um, the internet, right? As we're going to talk about next week, you've got HTTP, which is a protocol for exchanging web pages on the internet. Um, that's a standard interface. That's a way where people said, let's just, you know, send data all around. Um, and then just this is this is one I don't know why I I'm going to change some examples because I feel awkward talking about the same weird analogies, you know, five terms in a row. But train tracks are always a fun one, and I like train tracks because it's not always to do with standard interfaces either. Because um, if you look at like train track gauges around, I can't spell gauges. I can spell gauges. Map gauges how wide a track is, you know, and you, and you go around these world maps, and you'll actually see, you know, in different parts of the world. Um, they're different sizes. So, you know, you can kind of easily, well, it depends where, it's a bit complicated because, you know, different countries have different train tracks in it, but it's like lots of countries will figure out how to have standard interfaces between the tracks. Like if you look at Europe, you know, it's obviously quite intentional. I think there's probably a history of Europe I'm not familiar with, I would guess, where at some point they all, I don't want to go on a tangent about nothing I don't know, but I know that like there's countries like Russia that I think I read about how they would intentionally not use standard track sizes so that people couldn't invade them, right? Because, you know, classic wartime, you'd see a lot of a lot of invasions would be essentially bolstered through transport via rail, right? Um, so, you know, an example of cases where there are lots of standard interfaces and cases where there aren't standard interfaces. So, lots and lots and lots to think about. Um, all these systems have a simple thing in common, um, which I think Derpy kind of touched on a little bit and everyone had a pretty good attempt at, which is, you know, it's a universal method of connecting different systems together. That's a fairly high level summary. Obviously, you could go a little bit deeper into that, but that's like a good starting point for us. Um, but we're not here to talk about the philosophy of engineering, as fun as that is. We're here to talk about computer science and in particular standard interfaces when it comes to how software interacts, how different computer systems interact, uh, particularly application systems. And when you look at the most important way that a lot of application systems interact, it's pretty much just through the transfer of data, right? It's how they move data from one application to another. Um, you know, how, how is it that, you know, you're using a web browser right now watching this on YouTube, which is written in one language. And then when you, you know, type a comment into the YouTube comments, it goes and gets sent to a web server somewhere with Google that's written in another language on another system. How is that data actually transferred, you know, with people understanding it? So we need these standard interfaces in the world of data. Um, and to get that, we're going to use a data interchange format, right? And data interchange format is really just a way of saying that we will find a language that is simple enough that everyone can understand it. Another way of thinking about standard interfaces, right, just to really hammer the point home, is like waving, saying goodbye. You know, there are certain things across different languages in um, human society that we can make sense of, right? Smiles, tears, you know, all these kinds of things. So it's all, it's all really along the same thread. Um, so one of the ways we experience these standard interfaces is through this data interchange format. And we're going to be talking about three formats today. Um, again, some of these are used a little bit more for data interchange and some of them are just used for kind of standard data representation, but we'll dig into that a bit more. Um, but the main one we're going to be talking about is JSON. And the summary of what JSON is used for is it's a simple markup language that is really just there to help describe arrays, objects, numbers, strings, and booleans. So it's like a really, um, you wouldn't call it rich. It's like a really unriched, unenriched version of just simple data because it really can't store a lot. So we have a look at JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, even though JavaScript's in the title, it actually has remarkably little to do with JavaScript in terms of like it's, it's as standard in other non-JavaScript languages. So don't kind of walk away from learning this with an impression that you know, you've learned this because you've learned JavaScript. This has a relevance in your life, irrelevant to whether you've learned JavaScript or not. Um, but JSON is a, uh, a notation. It's a very, how would they describe it? A lightweight text-based language independent data interchange format. So that's really interesting. Lightweight means simple. Text-based means simple because it can all be represented, I guess, through ASCII sort of. Language independent when they say text-based, I mean, you know, it's all characters. You can 
you can look at JSON as a human, they can read it, even if it's complicated, right? You can always read it. It's like opening a CSV file if you've ever done that. You know, maybe it's all jarbled in the text editor, but it still looks like text. Language independent means that um, it doesn't matter whether you're in C or JavaScript or anything, and data interchange format we've talked about. Um, it was authored by someone, a bunch of people who really like JavaScript, so it kind of, I think, came out of the early JavaScript community, but again, we're not here for a history lesson. But it is a format made up of braces for objects, square brackets for arrays, um, and essentially all non-numeric items are based on having quotations wrapped around them. So it's actually very similar to JavaScript data structures, and you'll certainly feel a lot of that as you program with it. You'll be like, huh, actually this feels like a really simple version of JavaScript that I can use just to represent data and information. So here is a piece of JSON, um, and we want to represent this structure, which is an object that contains one key, and that key is a list of locations or an array of locations, and each location itself is an object that contains two keys, which is the suburb and the postcode, right? Now, you can see that immediately it's very, very similar to JavaScript. Um, remarkably similar. And, you know, if you actually, you've probably done some of, you know, lab, you've done lab one or lab two by this point, and you should be familiar with this if you're watching the lecture. If you haven't, you might want to go and check out some of that material again. But uh, you will notice a few differences between JSON as a representation of what a normal JavaScript object might look like or JavaScript, you know, structure. Um, one of them is that uh, in JavaScript, we don't allow trailing commas. I think this might have even been something I glossed over a bit in week one. I can't remember. Um, let me just open up our lecture code for a second. So, like, for instance, uh, in JavaScript, one thing I, I feel like I might have glossed over this in week one when we were going over the language, but uh, in JavaScript, we encourage you to actually put trailing commas at the end of all of your list items. This is something that you tended not to do in C uh, whenever you have an array or list of things, but it's something we encourage you to do in JavaScript. The reason for that is because it makes your code um, more easily mutable, more easily changeable, because you can just kind of swap lines around without having to create compile errors. Whereas if you don't have commas somewhere, you have to kind of think about, oh, I did. Okay, Bron, I'm having a bad moment, Bron. Thank you. Save us another minute or two. So. One thing about JSON is that we don't include those ever. It's a really simple notation. It has to be exceptionally, um, it has to be simple to be like easily consumed by everything basically. So that's one change. The other one is that object keys must be strings and include apostrophes. So what that means is that um, in JavaScript, you can do something like this. You can actually say, I have a key of suburb, a key of postcode, uh, particularly if it's just, you know, characters. Uh, you can't do that in JSON. Everything has to be actually explicitly a string. You know, so in these cases, this all has to be a string. Like, oop, like, there you go. Done. Um, yep, it also has to be double apostrophe. JavaScript doesn't, uh, JSON, sorry, doesn't love single apostrophes. So if you've got into a habit of single apostrophes in JavaScript, you probably need to go back to double apostrophes in JSON. But besides that, we're really dealing with something very standard, which is good. The cool thing about JSON is that most languages have the ability, either built in or via libraries, to read and write JSON. Um, and this makes it, again, remarkably powerful because it means that language A can take a data structure, represent it through JSON, this universal data interchange format, and send it somewhere else, right? Um, and most of the time, all these libraries, all these JSON libraries are really doing is just converting like language specific data structures to JSON strings. Because remember, everything in JSON is a string. Even though this kind of looks like code, it's actually just text. It's text that a program can take in and convert to something meaningful, but otherwise it's just text. So if we have a look at um, an example of some JSON code, I've got some here in week three. So remember week three, we're still in this environment one folder and we'll go to 3.1 called JSON it. Um, and in this case here, we have uh, 
a couple of things to look at. Let me make this window just a touch bigger. And this file is, is relatively easy to make sense of. Um, we're going to import the file system object from file system. Remember, file system is one of the built-in libraries to JavaScript. We had a look at those last week in one of the lectures where we talked about um, npm and importing. So you don't need to do any npm install for that one. It just kind of works as it, as it is. And then we've got ourselves here a data structure. It doesn't need to be called data structure. It could be called pineapple. Um, and it's very simple. It's an object that contains one key, very similar to what we saw before. That one key is a list and each list contains an object. Sorry, the list contains three objects and each object has two keys with you know respective two values. You can see we've got lots of trailing commas here. We don't have apostrophes or double apostrophes either around our keys for our objects. Um, and up until this point, you know, the code kind of makes sense. You know, I, I could just have this program here and I could just console log, you know, data structure like this. And then I could run it. I could say, well, you know, node um, in m1 source 3.1, like that. You know, seems to work fine, like that. Um, so, you know, we can actually just console log it. William says, in JSON, is it correct style to have spaces around the colon unlike JS? Uh, no, I don't think that's correct style or not. I don't think there really is a correct style necessarily. Um, that's fine. It's probably just how the lecture slides. No, I think I had something weird on the lecture slides back here. Yeah, I think that's just how the code is on the lecture slides. That's probably that white space could probably be gotten rid of for consistency. So fairly straightforward. Now what we're going to do is a really important line here, which is line 22. And what line 22 is going to do is it's going to take the JavaScript specific structure, right? Which is what we printed out before. And it's going to convert it to a string. And this function here, this is a stringify function that's part of the JSON object, right? It doesn't have to um, be imported. This JSON object, it's, it's actually, it's a bit of an awkward thing from a language design point of view. Like if you're a language designer, this probably wouldn't be ideal. Um, but it just means that without importing anything, you can write JSON and then get some functions on it. This will turn the structure into JSON. And what I want to do here is I want to contrast for you the difference between printing data structure, right? And printing data. So I run it now. And you'll see two things happen. The first time we get the data structure. Now remember, this is an actual structure that makes sense to JavaScript, that it just has to turn into text to display it to us because we've asked to log it. The one underneath though, is the result of a JSON stringify. Stringify means convert to a string. Uh, the result of that, which is why we get all this kind of gobbledygook here, which is just bunches of braces and apostrophes and, and, and lists and text like that. So this here is JSON. A computer can't understand this. So to take that analogy further, what I mean is if I say to this, try and print out um, the names, the value at the names key of the data structure, that will work. But if I try and do the same thing with data, which is the stringified one at the bottom, I'm going to get an error. Because for the first one, it's like, well, I know what that is because it's, you know, it's a language specific object like this. But for the second one, it just sees a string. It's like, it's literally the equivalent of me saying, you know, it, like it literally is the equivalent of me taking this, saying, you know, blah is equal to this. God damn it. Um, ah, okay. Scary. I know my fat head's in the way. Let me make this. There we go. Yep, um, so it's like taking this and it's literally like this line here on 25 is really the equivalent now of just saying console.log blah names like this. You, and we'll get undefined too, right? Because it's a bit silly, you know, JavaScript should really throw an exception or something. Um, but yeah. Uh, Kaiki asks a really interesting question, which is basically, hey, what's the difference between What's the difference between JSON stringify and uh, just two string? I like that question because what we could do here is like we could do a little test, which is we know data structure is the actual data structure. So we could console log the JSON stringify of data structure or we could console log um, 
where is it? Data structure dot to string. Now you can see that in the latter case it didn't like that and well I mean it did it did exactly what it's meant to do, which was that it saw that it was a very complicated structure, right? And instead of actually printing it out like it did with JSON, we just kind of got this like blanket object object thing. Now, obviously, the JavaScript language could be designed, right, in such a way that if you do two string, it could turn it into JSON. There's a hundred things it could do, but it's just at the end of the day, it, it doesn't do that. You know, it just doesn't do that. So, point is, we have this line data equals that. And now we want to, what we want to do, and this is a really common thing to do, is we actually want to save it to a file. So, right, I'm going to say here, I've got my file system. That's what I imported up the top here. Um, and I go, right, file sync. And now, and this is part of the, you know, file system library. I say that I would like to write to a file export.json. I can call it anything I want, but in this case, I'm going to like, you know, call it export.json. To that file, I'd like to write data which is a string because what you write to a file typically has to be a string typically um, and in this case uh, it is because we convert it to one and then the flag and this third argument of the writing to a file is a set of options now this is not something we cover extensively in the course there's only one option we need here which is what we call it it's a w flag which means to write to the file um, and that's needed there if we want to write to it so we run that code again um, and what you notice is after i run that code and I look inside, which folder is it in? I didn't save it. Here we go, let's run it. See, and this file just appeared. And when I look at export.json, I have a JSON file here, um, which is text, right? Because JSON's text, really, really easy. Yeah? Um, Tony says, is it like F put S in C? Well, like, yeah, the file, the right to file, like this line is like f put s and c, but f put s is just putting putting a string into a file, um, and similarly here we're just putting a, uh, you know, what would you call it? We're just putting like a piece of text we already converted. So the kind of real, the the kind of money element here, the part that you really need to be concerned with, is definitely like the JSON stringifying, because like writing to a file is something you could just Google. You know, you could just Google how to write. Um, you know, dried pineapple to a file, it would be fine. It would work normally. And you could open this file and there'd be dried pineapple there. But we don't want to put dried pineapple there. We want to put data there. So now data is actually going to be there. So that's the writing to JSON part there. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Because now we're going to talk about, uh, you know, reading. Reading from JSON. It's not that complicated. I'll just give you a minute. Whilst we're waiting for questions, if you have a look at the reading from JSON one, you'll see that it's actually remarkably similar. And it's fairly intuitive as well, right? Like you look at this and you're like, okay, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and the reason I think it makes a lot of sense is because it's basically the same code. Let's look, let's look at the differences. We've got read file sync, right? Read file sync is just different from write file sync. Instead of writing text to a file, we are reading text from a file. That's it. We are reading from export.json and instead of giving it the data to write to, we are pulling it out. Um, and then we needed to give it an R instead of a W in this case, because we're reading from it. Technically, uh, you can still read from it with the W and I'm not gonna get into file system flags or anything like that. Um, Danny, I don't think the W is capitalized. I think that might just be a slight illusion potentially. Um, and, you know, Derpy says, is it like file open? Yes, read file sync in JavaScript is just like opening a file. Um, that part is not that exciting. This is just reading in text. So if we actually look at this, 3.1 on JSON it, right? I can just console log JSON. Now, JSON is just a variable name. Yeah? So if I console log that, uh, uh, John Sonnet. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. Like this. 
Oh. Oh no, I've got a got a problem here. Eh, why? So, yeah, I'm just checking. JavaScript read sync file buffer. Buffer the entire. Yeah, yeah, might take a long time to read it. So let me just check something really quick. Uh, there's a few different ways to do this kind of thing. I'm just basic. Okay, so let me take a step back. What's what's happened here is that in certain languages like JavaScript, when you read really large files, right? When you read really large files, it's very um, it's very costly for the computer to sometimes read the file. If the file has many megabytes of text, it can be quite taxing from a processing standpoint to just like load that entire file into memory. Um, so what happened there was that it was loading it into kind of like a buffer, which is essentially just a way to optimize the loading of the file. So it sits in like a little bit of a queue, so to speak. Um, and what I've done here, which is not something you need to immediately be concerned with, is just trying to kind of change some flags here as to how to open the file. I basically forced it to say, yeah, please open it as text. Other things you can do here. You could have, why is my cursor gone? You, I can't see my cursor on the screen anymore. Okay, whatever. Another thing you can do is like, in this case, when you open the file, I could just like convert it to a string as well. That's another way. Because the buffer itself, wait, when you try and convert the buffer to a string, it'll actually just, you know, dump the whole thing forward. Um, yep. That's the file. That's the contents from the file. But the thing is, again, this is just a string. Like I said before, I can't just load that and say, hey, I'd like to get JSON names key. That doesn't make any sense. Right? It just doesn't. I'll get undefined again because it's like trying to get it out of a string. So what I need to do now is use the JSON library to convert it from the string. I need to parse it, which is another way of saying kind of like processing and make sense of from a string to an actual, from a JSON string to an actual piece of data. So now you'll see that like the contrast similarly here. This is the string that I read from the file and this is the actual object that I decoded from that JSON string, you know, into something real. And then that's really cool because I can use it now. So what we've essentially done is we've run a program over here with a complicated data structure as part of the program it has gone and packaged it up into this JSON data interchange format it has then stored that in a file um, and after it's stored it in a file it's then been opened by another running of a program that has opened and then can process it again so that's really really cool now if I go back to the questions um, you know Jen said I'm still confused as to what JSON does okay well JSON is a language. JSON is a way of representing data. JSON is a way of essentially creating a standard that says this is how you can represent some simple data with some braces and square brackets for lists and objects and some double quotes for strings and numbers and decimals, you know, true or false. Very, very kind of contained space. Um, what we're doing with JavaScript when we use this json.stringify or this json.parse is that the writers of JavaScript, the engine, have written into it a library that can encode or decode JSON from that language's data structures. So in this case, the people who write some of the environments for JavaScript, this function, bam, can take JavaScript, turn it into a string. In this file, can take a string, turn it into JavaScript and that string is JSON if it wasn't JSON like how could you ever how could you ever predictably make sense of it you know you just be like I, I don't know what this is it could be anything there's no standard way for you to interpret it which is why it can work with all these different languages like I'll show you this right in Python's Python's different so let's say I make a file here in another language called um, you know J yeah js.py and then I'm going to forget how to open JSON in Python. I mean, I vaguely remember. Um, right. I'm going to go grab a piece of sample code. It's not much. It's only a few lines. 
Oh my god, just give me the code. I clicked on the wrong link, clearly. There we go. Yep, fairly straightforward. Most of this isn't needed. This is a different programming language. It's not something you need to be concerned with, but the point is that I can go and say, I'd like to open export.json and I would like to... Um, let me let me get the, the language consistent. Oh, I kind of can't because of how that language works. But like, let's say it's like, uh, I'll call this one JSON string. Like I'm going to read the text or like JSON file. And then I'm going to say that... Um, the data is JSON dot loads sorry testing my knowledge here right so let's say I didn't get that wrong and I probably did and we try and run this now there you go there's that data and I can probably do what I said before where I can say you know data dot names there you go so like what I've actually done here is we've gone and, you know, we've, we've made data in JavaScript, used a library to convert it to a JSON string and then opened it in another program, in another programming language with another library here in this programming language that is capable of, you know, reading and interpreting that standard JSON language uh, into Python, in this case, his own data structures, which would be very different, you know what I mean? Like they're just very, very different. So, yeah. Cool. I think that's it on JSON. That's, this is an important one because we see a lot of this in the course and we're going to move on to another language now. But again, just before I do, I want to pause for 10 seconds. Well, 30 seconds to see if people have any questions. Tony says, is JSON accepted by all languages? That's really up to the language designer. Um, as far as I know, pretty much all major languages either have a JSON library built in, have it built by, built from day, very early on and easily importable. Like, so J JavaScript, it's built in. Python, it's built in, but you actually have to explicitly import it, but it's still built in. It's just the namespace isn't immediately there. Um, I assume languages like C++, you have to install a library externally. Um, Most would, especially again, most application layers and particularly, sorry, most application software um, and particularly any software that interacts with a lot of web stuff will always have it. Bron says, so JSON is just data storage or do you sometimes call methods slash functions inside a JSON file? It's just data storage, but I want to be clear. JSON is not data storage. JSON is a language definition. This, the, the, and I know you mean this, but I'm just trying to be really specific. The actual JSON is just stored as text. It's actually just a text file. It's just ASCII in a file. It's just that the arrangement of that ASCII is, is to a certain standard, to a certain common interface, which is defined by the JSON standard. It's like a CSV, you know, like CSVs are not too different, um, which is quite interesting. Allison says, is the data structure store in the same format for all languages so that the data structure in JSON can be used in Python too? Exactly. Like a JSON file looks like a JSON file. There is no JSON file for JavaScript and Python and C. It's, it's, it like is JSON. It's a language. It's a definition. It's a standard, standard interface, right? Um, Bron says, so there's no JSON interpreter. Um, you can't, uh, let me answer it better. You can't run JSON, right? You can't just run it. It's not a programming language, you know? Like a CSV, you can't run a CSV. It's just a way of storing data. I'm going to move on. Um, a slightly newer... I will answer this one last question from Derpy. Um, so JSON is like a bridge to transfer inputs and outputs across languages. JSON is like a bridge to connect data between languages. I don't know if I get into inputs and outputs. But speaking of like standard interfaces, YAML. YAML is a really weird recursive name that stands for YAML ain't markup language. Um, bit of a funny name, I won't go into it. Um, it's a popular 
pr it's a popular modern interchange format due to its ease of editing and concise nature. So you got to think of this as like a JSON alternative. And it has pros and cons compared to JSON. And one is not better or worse. They are simply different. At its core, JSON is really useful for actually storing data and sending data over networks. YAML is a bit more useful for kind of standard configuration files. So less like, um, uh, how would you put it? Less like sending and more just like config, like config files or um, like you, you kind of seen these already, right? Like in your project, oh, sorry, I always forget how often GitLab logs me out. Ah. Right, like in your project, if I just go and open some random groups project, W13A arrow, right? Um, you know, they have a package.json and like, this is a good example. Like package.json is not really sent anywhere, right? It's not really like sent or like, sure, it's stored in a file, but it's not like you're writing programs that are reading and writing to it and you're sending it over networks. It's kind of just existing there, but it's a nice, easy way to just represent simple data. So YAML is an alternative to this. And if you have a look, it looks kind of similar to JSON in the sense of like this data structure you see here is meant to mimic what we, what we saw above here with locations and then lists of suburb postcode. Um, but it's much more compact. So, and the way they got around this was that unlike JavaScript, indentation matters. So instead of relying on, you know, braces and, and square brackets and all these other kind of double quotes and lots of boilerplate fluff, we simply just use indentation as well as these dashes you'll see here next to suburb and postcode um, to represent data. So if we look at like, say, a, we go online, you know, YAML interpreter, um, something that we can like play with. You know, this isn't, this doesn't run YAML. It just simply like tells us if it works, right? Um, and you'll see if we look at our code, you can, we can create objects. So like if you imagine that everything is like an object in, in YAML, or maybe let me get the YAML to JSON converter up. There's many of these, right? It's not like the one, I should say a YAML to JSON converter. Um, and on the left here, if I start writing YAML like locations, um, and then inside there, I start copying, you know, dash suburb Kensington and we convert it, you can kind of start to see the pattern here. So the pattern here is that um, <clears throat> locations is one of the keys and I could make more keys just by saying, you know, uh, you know, Hayden, um, something, something, use my last name, Smith, hello, there, I don't even know if I've done that right. Yeah. Um, let's like play around with this a bit. What are we noticing? Well, we're noticing that indentation matters in the sense that this second something, because it was further in, it actually like says I'm part of that, right? Uh, so, you know, it's like everything on the very left-hand column is part of the main object. And then everything kind of indented from that is like part of the sub element. The dash is used to say, this is a new list item. So notice what, ha let me zoom in a bit. Notice what happens here when I add like another dash here. Watch the something, it suddenly goes from that to that. So the dash is a way of saying this is a new item in the list. So what happens is if I wanna say, okay, I've got a suburb of Kensington and a postcode of 2033, because I didn't use a new dash, it thinks it's like kind of part of the same object, but you'll see if I put a dash here, it now thinks it's like a second object, like a second item in the list. So think of the, the dashes are like a new item, like, like a array push or something. So two dashes means two items in the list. One dash means one item in the list. And if I don't have the dash there, it just kind of can assume that it's the next thing down. So you notice it's immediately much more compact than JSON, which is one of the reasons it's probably grown in a lot of popularity because what it means is that you can uh, sometimes describe what might be otherwise a little bit more verbose data structures like this. Like if we go back to um, our package.json here, let's take this from W13A arrows group. Let's paste it here. Well, how do we go the other way? Go uh, JSON to YAML, right? See that? It's like a slightly more, um, easy way to represent it. And you notice here, there's no dash here, right? There's no dash uh, before validator because 
the objects themselves are made up of more objects. So you don't need the dash because it's not a list. So you can just say, yep, scripts has these items in it, test and dependencies has these items in it. So again, it can it can help you really write some some very straightforward, like, you know, um, country, you know, city, suburb, I don't know, street, um, Anzac parade. Now this doesn't make any sense, but again, a little bit lighter. So that was a very practical demonstration of YAML. Um, again, very, very simple language. You don't actually get asked to do much with this in the course at all. And you probably won't see a ton of it. Um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I probably work with like, you know, two thirds JSON, one third YAML, but the YAML is nearly exclusively configuration files. I've never written YAML to a file. I've never read YAML from a file. It's usually stuff like package. Like package.json is a really good example of what YAML might be used for, um, but actually storing data and transferring it over the network, much less so, definitely much less so. And then the last kind of interchange format is XML. XML stands for extensible markup language. It's kind of like a legacy or old school way of uh, expressing data. And it looks very, um, it looks very like weird and over the top, right? Looks, yeah, okay. That, that's the word I'm looking for. Bron says it looks horrendous. Exactly. So, um, it's ugly and it's, it's, it's kind of over the top. It's, it's like rooted in the same basics of HTML. Yeah. So many of you have seen HTML, um, want to be HTML. That's a good example. Yep. Exactly. Um, and it's, it's just verbose, you know, like it's kind of like the JSON, except you don't only have the key, but you have to close the key. You know, everything's got an open and close. And you'll see here that the density of like data to boilerplate is really bad. You know, so most of it is not the actual data itself. It's just structure. Um, but it's, it's very like old school. It was kind of propped up most of how particularly the web interacted for a long, long time. So this was kind of like Jace. This was like before YAML helped be a counterpart to JSON and before JSON even existed, this was a, a big thing. And you can still see some relics of it today. You might've seen this around the internet where you got an XML file. And like to this day, most um, website sitemaps, you know, like if I go to like my company's sitemap, most of the time it's still an XML just because it's, you know, I don't know why it still is an X. This is unrelated to anything, but um, it's just how some of these things like to still work. Um, so it exists. That's why we talk about it. Otherwise, we just pretend it doesn't exist like we do with 99% of computing, you know. But in this case, it's kind of relevant. I already talked about the issues to do with this. Um, it's just not really used in modern languages. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to come up in the course. It's really just a chance to give you a, a look at it. And Tony says, are we going to use all three of these languages in the course or are we only going to focus on JSON? So JSON's what, I'm, <laughs> JSON's what we're going to focus on. But I think what I want to leave people with from this lecture is that this particular lecture is not hard. You know, like all of you are really smart. And in fact, if we didn't even have this lecture and we just gave you like some sample code and said, here's some JSON, you should, you all have big brains. You'd be able to pick it up like that, honestly. You know, that before I taught this, it wasn't taught as in a core undergrad degree explicitly and no one was sadder for it. People just learned it. The reason this lecture exists isn't to show you a couple of code examples for JSON, it's to put in your put in your heads the broader idea of why this stuff matters and where it fits into the world, you know? To give you some like language and some context to things. So it's mainly language and context, though most of what you'll be exposed to in the course will be JSON. I don't think we expose you to any YAML. Um, sometimes we ask exam questions about it, but we never see any XML. So um, again, I'm gonna ask for any last questions for 30 seconds. Otherwise we are going to jump to a break. Uh, for 10 minutes before we get into the second part of the lecture around continuous integration. I'll just give you a short moment. What is my favorite data format? I don't really have a favorite data format. <laughs> it's a good question though. I'm pretty indifferent to most things as long as they help me get what I need to do done. <laughs> 
so cool please leave some feedback love some feedback um, would appreciate it as always it's so easy to do um, and other than that thank you